I'm Dave Van Zandt, the president of, of the New School here, and I just want to welcome everyone uh, this morning to this today's program uh, entitled No Way to Pay Rent, What's Next for Homeless Families in New York City? Uh, we're especially pleased to have with us today, and we'll hear from him very uh, soon, uh, the New York City Department of Homeless Services Commissioner, Seth Diamond. Thanks for being with us. Uh, this is sponsored by the Milano School. Uh, Milano has a special commitment to the field of urban policy analysis and management, offering masters and PhD programs, classes that range from environmental policy and public finance to economic development and nonprofit management. A Milano education, with its particular combination of policy and practice, prepares students to be especially effective in urban policy in the urban policy arena. Our students include uh, current and future policymakers, nonprofit leaders labor and community activists, legislative staffers, private sector executives. And within Milano, um, we are very proud of the Center for New York City Affairs, which seeks to promote uh, innovation in public policy, through, often through influential, influential reports, gives many of our students a solid grounding in the work of applied policy research, and helps organize forums like this uh, that bring together community leaders, academics, and elected officials just to discuss critical issues in New York City. Today's event has been made possible by Edison Properties, the Milano Foundation, and Cirrus Fund. Now, in order to introduce our speakers, I'd like to turn it over to our director um, for the Center for New York Affairs, Andrew White. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Good morning. So first off, I want to apologize for not having the usual stage here. So those of you in the back, uh, you'll just have to stretch a little to see the panel when they come up. Um, I'm Andrew White, and I direct the Center for New York City Affairs. Our work is primarily around applied policy research on issues like child welfare, um, juvenile justice, public education, um, and the community-based um, services and safety net system in the city. Um, we also are the home of InsideSchools.org, so I hope, hope you'll check out our website, sites plural. Um, I also want to thank Commissioner Diamond for coming and the panelists and Michael Powell for agreeing to moderate. First, I'm going to tee this up with a, a few notes, and then I'll introduce the commissioner. He'll give his talk. He'll do a Q&A with um, Michael, and then we'll bring the panel up. Um, a few important facts. As of this past Monday, there were 8,559 families with children living in homeless shelters in New York City. These families include more than 16,740 children and 12,000 adults. And the numbers are actually inching upwards now. Um, in fact, since early 2009, there have been more than 8,000 families in shelter every month but one. And the most recent data that just came out show that April 2012 is the highest reported number of families in shelter in April for many, many years. So as a result, the city now relies not only on the family-style shelters, the Tier 2s that were developed in, mostly in the 1990s, but also on thousands of hotel rooms. Um, th uh, a couple of thousand units in hotels. And most of these 16,000 kids are going to school and to childcare and to youth programs. Um, since some travel great distances to stay in the schools they were in when they first lost their apartments, um, others are concentrated in schools that are constantly struggling with transitions and high rates of absenteeism, which we see in our public education work. Um, generally speaking, it's pretty obvious that shelters are not a great place, a great environment to raise children. Um, we decided to organize today's discussion because rent subsidies are hard, harder to come by now than they've been in many years, and we found, you know, while I haven't written about homelessness in years, I, I started hearing a lot more from parents and from students here about this sort of perplexed question like, okay, so there's no more rent subsidies um, available to families in shelter. How are, how are people going to get out of the shelters? Um, so looking back at how this developed, over the years, um, a very high percentage of families in shelter have told survey takers that they're there because they were either evicted or because they were doubled up and the doubled up situation no longer worked out. In the past, once you were in shelter, 
there was usually a relatively good chance you could eventually qualify for a rent subsidy of some kind. Um, back in 2002, nearly 2,000 families qualified for Section 8, and more than 1,100 moved into public housing out of shelter. But the federal and city governments have ratcheted back the availability of those subsidies over 10 years. For many of the years in between, there have been city and state rent subsidies that not only provided for more families, I mean, they, they provided temporary subsidies for thousands of families every year, but now those are gone as well, and thus this discussion. Um, many of us here remember the old massive welfare hotels. Um, many of us remember the EAUs that were scattered in every borough, emergency assistance units. Um, Catherine Street in Manhattan is one of the most memorable f to me. Um, but also the Brooklyn Arms Hotel, the Cumberland Hospital. We've come a long way since those days when the shelters were extremely unpleasant places to live. Um, the conditions are better, and even the conditions of permanent housing in New York are a lot better than they were back then. And yet, in the discussions that led up to this, uh, this event, it became very clear to me that this is one of the policy areas that's incredibly fraught. There's a lot of disagreement, there's a lot of frustration, um, not only among advocates, but among the nonprofits running the programs and among the government officials running the programs. So I was intrigued to find how raw all this is, and I'm hoping we can have a very civil and constructive discussion that maybe can lead somewhere. Um, the problem is as difficult to solve as it ever was. Um, and I want to point out the obvious that in part because providers were not necessarily eager to sit up on the panel today. Um, <laughs> you're all here though, so you're going to be part of the conversation. Uh, so this panel is not ideal. You know, um, to, to be blunt about it, it's a bunch of white folks standing in front of the room talking about a shelter system that is primarily, almost entirely serving black and Latino New Yorkers. So I apologize for that, um, and I hope we can get people in the room involved in this discussion to help um, deal with that. So um, in the spirit of pragmatism and action and trying to make something different, um, I'd like to introduce Commissioner Seth Diamond, who has led the Department of Homeless Services in the Bloomberg administration for exactly two years now. He's worked on poverty issues in city government for many years, and among other things, as Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Human Resources Administration. Commissioner Diamond. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here this morning to talk about, as we, or for, as Andrew already discussed, how we continue to make progress in our efforts to assist homeless families and families at risk of homelessness. It is particularly appropriate, I think, that we have this discussion at the New School, which has always encouraged forward-thinking dialogue on the critical issues facing our country and our city. To fulfill, as I believe we must, the New School's mission of bringing about a actual positive change, this discussion must have two essential ingredients. First, as one of the New School's most famous attendees, Eleanor Roosevelt, once said, with the new day comes new strengths and new thoughts, and we must bring our best new ideas to the table. Second, while we should not limit our imagination in the dreams we have for our clients, the proposals to achieve them must be grounded in the realities we face. While bold, progressive thinking is essential and too often missing from today's national debates, we do a disservice to the families we serve if that discussion holds out false hope in easy solutions that ultimately cannot be implemented. Today, I hope to set out why we need a new public discussion on the issues facing homeless families. We must, as Eleanor Roosevelt advised, build on the strengths we have, those of the people we serve and of the system we have built. Those strengths have helped create the best system in the country for serving those who are homeless and infused with new thoughts will allow us to make it even better. 
Before discussing our direction for tomorrow, I want to spend a minute reviewing where we are today. Let me begin by saying something on which we all agree, whether we wanted to sit on the panel or not, whether we are new to this issue or not, no family should be homeless. And we can be grateful in New York City we have a system for those who are. Last night has, been, has already been said about 8,550 families slept in our city shelter system. Unlike the shelter system in every other major United States city, all of which have time limits or a finite capacity, we here in New York City are prepared to shelter all who are eligible. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, we provide safe and secure shelter to every homeless family with children, every adult family, and every individual who faces a housing crisis. This caring system developed out of the mayor's belief that it is the city's responsibility to treat all who enter our shelter system with compassion and respect. One of the most visible signs of that commitment is the Family Intake Center in the Bronx, which turns one year old today. A building that is both welcoming and state-of-the-art, where families can apply for shelter but obtain services to avoid shelter. The spirit of the mayor's pledge is also seen in the work of thousands of employees of non-for-profit agencies, some of whom are here today. Many with decades of experience fighting homelessness who operate under sh shelters under contract to the city. Every day, our not-for-profit partners help, assist, guide, and encourage shelter residents on the path to a better life. It is their dedication and hard work with that of DHS and other city agencies that help make the city shelter the most comprehensive in the nation. Our tremendous progress in serving homeless families did not occur by chance. We proceeded from a consensus among nonprofit providers, advocates, and government officials that homeless families should receive temporary emergency shelter in a safe environment and receive services to overcome their housing crisis as quickly as possible. We should be proud to live in a city that recognizes this obligation and, pro and provides $800 million annually in taxpayer support to make it a reality. As critical as consensus was in developing the city shelter system, the absence of consensus in other areas is limiting public discussion and hampering our ability to make progress. We should not rest on creation of the best family shelter system in the country. Instead, we must continually look for ways to help families exit shelter and remain in the community. We should not be satisfied that thousands of shelter residents have gone to work in recent years, but should develop strategies to support them further. We should not accept that shelter is the only answer for every at-risk family, but should explore all available alternatives. We in government have an obligation to continually propose new strategies, and they should be the subject of robust public debate. That debate should be driven by our beliefs in the elements required for a fair and compassionate system, and informed by the evidence and the realities of the day. The people who suffer most from the lack of a productive dialogue are those who have no time to waste. The families we serve who need a better system that constantly strives to help them in their effort to move to an improved life. Nowhere is the need for a new debate more clear than in the discussion of how to help homeless families move out of shelter. Here, the city, as has already been discussed, has attempted to make up for the lack of state and federal support by putting in place innovative programs that invest in the success of homeless families who work and leave the shelter system. The most recent of these being the Advantage Rental Supplement. At every turn, our attempt to discuss and support these programs was met with one refrain. No program is acceptable unless it awards Section 8 vouchers or NYCHA housing to those in shelter. It doesn't matter that the city's program is the most generous municipal subsidy in the country, far exceeding what is available elsewhere. It doesn't matter that the city adjusted the subsidy to better meet the needs of families and developed one that was far more costly for city taxpayers than prior subsidies, but better supported those in shelter who wanted to work 
and grow their income. It doesn't matter that nearly nine out of 10 families who exited shelter on advantage succeeded in remaining stably housed, or even by the most conservative estimate, seven out of 10 succeeded in doing so. The response of some was not a measured inquiry about how to fashion a better subsidy that recognizes present day realities, but a reflexive call to end the local subsidy immediately and award Section 8. The problem, of course, is that Section 8 is not an available resource. Because of a lack of funding in Washington, there will be no new vouchers for the foreseeable future. Even awarding vouchers to homeless families and others as they leave the Section 8 program is not, due to previous commitments, an option. Nor is public housing an available resource for families in shelter. Turnover in public housing is also limited and significantly down from recent years. And the limited number of apartments that do become vacant are needed in connection with other long-term changes NYCHA is making. Ultimately, the lack of meaningful dialogue and the inability of others to adjust to new realities had destructive consequences. A year ago, the state stripped the Advantage program of two-thirds of its funding, taking with it a $150 million investment in the success of homeless families that we will not recover. As a coda to this elimination, the state prohibited the use of its own money or federal money to finance a housing subsidy. With Section 8 not a viable option and a local subsidy with state and federal participation prohibited by statute, the consequence of the failure to have a debate is evident. While the loss of advantage is the clearest example of the results of the lack of a reasonable debate, it is not the only one. Our ability to provide improved services to those in shelter is similarly constrained by a frozen-in-time approach. For over 20 years, a consistent theme among social service providers has been the need to provide more coordinated services. The homeless families we serve often have multiple needs, and it, thus it's essential that the providers who serve them communicate with each other. That clients should not have to run from one service provider to another, has been an often relayed concern. We successfully implemented a multi-service model at PATH, our family intake center, nearly eight years ago. Today, a family entering PATH has immediate access to services offered by multiple agencies, such as the city's Human Resources Administration, the Administration for Children's Services, and the Department of Education. On the shelter side, one of our excellent single adult providers sought to implement just such a multi-service model in a new shelter last year. The plan was a comprehensive shelter model, a residential and ambulatory drug treatment program, a day treatment program for the mentally ill, a transitional program tailored to the needs of street homeless clients, and a mental health shelter for homeless men all under one roof. Staff of these various programs would be trained to share information and develop coordinated service plans. But it's an expensive model. To make delivery of wraparound services economically feasible, the shelter had to be somewhat larger than the 200-bed limit required under a local law that the City Council passed 20 years ago. That legislation passed in a different era, when homeless families were, ho were housed in notorious welfare hotels and in congregate shelters, without the wealth of services available today. So size was a legitimate concern back then. But today, instead of engaging in a productive discussion about the gains to be had from a multi-service model, we were met with a no-compromise lawsuit to prevent the shelter from opening. While the city ultimately won the right to proceed after months of costly litigation, the message to providers who may want to invest money in crafting new models was clear. You will be challenged. No public discussion will be allowed. The old rules must be adhered to even if they do not make sense in the 21st century. A second example concerns our effort to provide services to young ser single mothers, services which are crucial to ending their homelessness and preventing it in the next generation. We could expand those services even further to this population if we could move away from another decades-old restriction that requires every family in shelter to have their own bathroom and cooking facility. Here again, this local law made sense back in the days when families were sheltered in welfare hotels 
or herded into congregate shelters. Under our proposal, all families would have their own bedroom, but two families might share a bathroom and a kitchen. The families living together could support each other, and the savings from this model could be invested in additional services that would help those leave shelter quickly to homes of their own. This approach has been used successfully in the city's domestic violence system and in shelters across the country. We understand we must proceed cautiously here. We are open to discussion about how families should be screened for shared living, what ages of children would be appropriate for this model, and how this approach should be evaluated. But instead of having this discussion, we are told that the old restrictions must remain in place, even though the shelter system of yesteryear is long gone. The casualties of this discussion are once again the homeless families. If we are to make progress fighting homeless families, we must reject the misconception that a rental subsidy is the only ticket out of shelter. In the period since Advantage ended, over 600 families each month have continued to leave the shelter system. We must build on that success by helping our families in shelter begin and remain working. While, we, while work alone is not sufficient to ensure stability, it is an essential component. The notion that everyone able to work should work is embraced by New Yorkers and is an accepted truth in most social service programs. Unfortunately, that consensus does not extend to homeless families, where the public discussion too often dwells on the obstacles families face and not on their determination to succeed, especially if they are linked to supportive services. The evidence is clear. Most families can work and want to work. From January of 2010 until today, over 20,000 homeless shelter residents have gone to work. Those numbers should encourage us and cause us to alter some of our long-held assumptions. Let us agree that shelter residents who can work must work, and then let's have a public discussion that focuses on how we can help them move up the economic ladder. Let's talk about how we can make sure those who leave shelter are working and that they can improve their income and their skills so they can continually earn more. Let's talk about how to boost the income of women who work by linking them to child support. And let's make sure our parents can support their children in school so that they too can reach their full potential. If we are to make true progress in helping those who are homeless, two other strategies must be part of the debate. First, we must discuss how to help families who are at risk of homelessness avoid shelter. For all the years I have worked in social services, one clear message has been that city, the city must do a, a better job at prevention. Prevention, it is said, helps families from going into crisis and is clearly cheaper in the long run. The city has been a national leader in developing preventive services for those at risk of homelessness, and we now have an entire network of community-based offices with a presence in every borough and have been very successful in preventing shelter entry. But preventive services are only successful if they are used, and too many families still seek shelter as a first resort. To address this, the city recently embarked upon a campaign to expand outreach to those communities hardest hit by homelessness. Surprisingly, our efforts were publicly condemned as a waste of money with no possible benefit. We will go ahead with the campaign despite those who oppose it, but its value would be increased if the message was amplified with help from homeless advocates. Here at the New School for Social Research, I'm sure there is one topic on which we can all agree and embrace, research. Yet, when the city sought to research the effectiveness of one of its programs, something that should be supported and encouraged, it was disappointing to see that research attacked. This despite the, research, the fact that the research was led by one of the city's most respected ad academics, Cuties John Malenkoff, and was being performed by ABT Associates, the nation's leading social services research firm. Some raised questions about the experimental and control group in the research design, and we were prepared to have a reasonable discussion on this important topic. That is not what we got, and unfortunately for the people we served, the debate dragged on. But fortunately for those we served, we are going ahead. 
Let us agree that an honest assessment of city programs and services should be welcomed and not derided. Finally, we must continue to discuss how to build affordable housing for those we serve. While under Mayor Bloomberg, the city has made an unprecedented investment in housing for people of all income levels, government resources are limited. We must explore ways to bring down the cost of housing so it can be available to low-income New Yorkers without any subsidy or only with a small one. Such a debate will involve many parties and many complex issues, as the existing cost of housing is roaded in building codes, zoning restrictions, and market conditions. But if we are not willing to have that debate and to challenge our traditional assumptions, those who will suffer the most are those we are trying to serve. How to help those at risk of homelessness avoid shelter, how to provide better services to those in shelter, how to help them return to the community and sustain themselves through work, these are the critical issues that we should be debating in our shelter system. Let us discuss these issues openly and honestly as we seek to assist homeless families in moving their lives in the direction we all want them to go forward. Thank you very much. I want to now introduce our moderator, Michael Powell. He's the, excuse me, the Gotham columnist from the New York Times and a f former reporter and bureau chief for the Washington Post, and before that covered the city for New York Newsday. Michael. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'll just say a quick word. I mean, I, I am struck as the commissioner was talking that, I mean, the city has this really terrific social democratic tradition. And I do think that, that you know, perhaps before we go into, into the discussion today, I mean, it is worth reflecting on that. You know, when I have covered this, the, the nation, both as an economics writer for the Times and then before that for the Washington Post, one is struck as you go from, from town to town up through, I mean, even through the Northeast, which we tend to think of as uh, basically placed with a fairly liberal traditions, you know, the number of places where what we take is sort of starting points for discussion, that there's a right to shelter, that there's a vigorous housing program, a housing program, by the way, that is now, what, four mayors, four mayors old, um, and continuing to produce an enormous number of units. <coughs> Excuse me, we tend to take these things for granted, and it is really kind of striking when you move beyond the, the city limits, the extent to which these are in fact, um, you know, sort of vanishingly rare. Um, and anyway, uh, so, so, you know, with, an, with I think a, a bow towards, you know, four mayors um, and, you know, all sorts of advocates and everyone else who have worked to make that happen, it is a quite striking um, legacy. I guess, Commissioner, you know, one of the things I was wondering about, um, in, in you laid out you know, number of things um, where, to your view, it would be very useful if, if the, in particular, the advocacy community more, um, you know, sort of would grapple in kind of more vigorous or, or um, subtle debate. Uh, I wonder, you know, from your, from looking at it from the other point of view, as you look at the city and your administration, no different, I should say, than previous administrations came in you know, saying, well, we're going to cut homelessness, you know, in half. We're going to, you know, we're going to re greatly reduce numbers. As you look at it, are there places where, you know, as, as you look back on, say, the 10 years of Bloomberg, where, where you might have done something different yourself, not you, but, but the, the administration? In other words, what are some of the lessons that you may have learned or been chastened by? <laughs> well, uh, it's on? Okay. Um, you know, the obvious uh, one that a lot of people point to is the, the commitment to reduce homelessness. And, and a lot, I've gotten a lot of questions about whether that was a mistake to, to make such a public and bold commitment to, to reduce the numbers. Um, we obviously have not gotten the reduction that we wanted. But uh, I think in, in really every way, the commitment that the mayor made to reduce homelessness was very important to the city's efforts. And while we didn't get the census reduction we wanted, we got an entirely revamped uh, and re-energized and improved system for people who come into it. We would not have invested in a new 
uh, Path Intake Center and all the tremendous changes to make that we've made in terms of um, improved shelter, improved linkages with not-for-profit agencies, improved services, uh, a total revamp of the process that homeless families go through, that would not have been possible if the mayor had not focused attention uh, by striking out a very bold and ambitious goal. So that I would not revisit. There are obviously different policy decisions along the way. We had some rental subsidies I referenced that did not work out as well as we wanted. We ended up with one, the Advantage program, that I thought was a very strong program that helped people grow their income and was uh, very unfortunate when that program ended. Um, yeah, we had some iterations of that before that were, that weren't as strong, and I think uh, we ended up in a place with a very strong message, the importance of work, the importance of going to work and a way to support people in doing so. And I think that ultimately is the right message and the one that uh, can sustain us going forward. Right, I guess what I wonder is you now have basically a record number of homeless uh, in the system um, and virtually no way out in terms of housing, and I, and I wonder, so so what if you're looking at um, two more years of, of this administration, and you know one hopes a, a, a commit, similar commitment by the next administration? So how do you do it if if there's no if there's sort of no housing if housing isn't at least a piece of that? Well, I, I think that's a misconception, and um, over 621 families a month. Uh, have left the shelter system with no rental subsidy in the period since Advantage ended. Uh, is it more difficult? Do we need to support those families better? Do we have to work harder to make sure that they're in uh, better housing or that we're linking them with services to maintain themselves? Absolutely. Should we invest more in community services once they're out so that uh, if they run into difficulties, they have a place to go before they come back to the shelter system? No question about it. But the idea that the, the door will be closed as soon as the rental subsidy ends is, is false. That's just not the reality we face. In fact, more people are leaving on their own now than they were before the, uh, the subsidies, uh, when the, uh, compared to a time when the subsidies were in place. But, yes, but we guess, want to do more. But can you drive the number down? I guess that's what I'm getting at. Can you actually drive that number down, cut it in half, whatever, um, without having as a piece, as a, again, you sort of look at this right array, this this you know this landscape of different programs and you know and, and, and efforts, without having housing as a piece of that. Well, the more housing, affordable housing resources that are available, certainly it would help the situation. But you again, you have to deal with the realities that we face, and many of the traditional resources that had been relied on are not available now. So. We can't uh, hope that they would exist and expect that they'll come into existence. We have to plan for the, the situation we face. And uh, the traditional federal resources of public housing and Section 8 are not available. That's why I think we have to look differently, consider building housing that maybe departs from some of the traditional uh, structures that the city had in place that makes it more costly. There are ways to build more affordable housing. There are groups in the city that have done a lot of work at could, looking at changes in codes and. Could I just you know because yeah, yeah, I'm I'm okay. interested by that. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit? The, the you know sort of what are some of the, if if you could. Yeah, the the, you know. the city's uh, the city's building codes uh, like a lot of city uh, rules have been built up for years with um, restrictions and rules and um, regulations that make sense each one independently, but together. They uh, weave a very complex and expensive web for anyone who is wanting to build housing in the city. And there are regulations that you could peel off that would make it cheaper. Um, again, each restriction has some constituency. So there will be uh, people who will oppose more dense housing in certain neighborhoods because it will bring more people into a uh, tr space than would otherwise be allowed. But if you can build more dense housing, you can make it cheaper and you might be able to bring the cost to the level where it could be affordable for people at lower income levels. There are other kinds of restrictions that um, could be modified slightly that, again, would make housing cheaper. Each one would be a fight, and each one would, will be very difficult, but I think that's the kind of discussion we should be having. I guess I, I – well, let me ask you, just to follow up on that, are you talking about, for instance, having – potentially having a couple of families share a – 
uh, an apartment? I mean, would that be one way around it? Or? There could be. Uh, you could, for example, have single uh, people live in a, a somewhat more con a suite type uh, housing where they each had their own rooms, but they shared some common uh, aspects pe like people do in colleges or a lot of young people do when they're starting out. That's very common, but that's not allowed in some neighborhoods or in some uh, by some zoning uh, rules. So if you could do things like that, that could bring down the cost of housing. Um, you know, there has to be a multi-layered approach. That alone will not solve it. There has to be public money and a public investment, and that's uh, why the city has invested so heavily under the mayor. Uh, 162,000 units of subsidized housing designed to reach people at a variety of income levels. And it would be wonderful if there were more federal resources. I, th despite the fact that uh, I don't want to count on them, if they were to be made available, we would, of course, embrace them and figure out the best way to use them to serve all New Yorkers. There are, unfortunately, as you probably know, nearly 200,000 New Yorkers on the Section 8 waiting list. There is a seven-year waiting list for public housing. So the need for affordable housing in the city is clear, and there are uh, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers not in shelter in the community who are living in difficult conditions who could access that. We want more housing for all of them, uh, and we need to look at the best ways to get there. I guess I, I come back, though. I mean, <laughs> without housing as a piece of that at the end of this pipeline, which is, I believe, the first time this has been true in 20 years, right, of homeless uh, policy without having some percentage uh, of housing. Can you really lo look uh, realistically to bringing down that, you know, what is now a record number of homeless? Well, first of all, let me just reiterate, we wanted to have a subsidy continue. Uh, right. We were the advocates for continuing it, uh, among the only advocates uh, asking for the state and uh, the city uh, and the federal government to continue funding what we thought was a very successful program that invested in the success of homeless families that moved well over 20,000, 25,000 households out of shelter. The overwhelming number, whatever the exact number, if you want to argue about that, but the overwhelming number remained successfully in the community even when the subsidy ended. So we agree that the a subsidy that is uh, balanced with costs shared by all levels of government could be a, an important part of the solution. But unfortunately, that's not the reality we have. The state ended support, took its money, took its federal money, and then on top of that passed a law saying there'll be no new subsidies uh, into the future, and they aim that law only at New York City. So um, th that's not changing, and that is unfortunately part of the realities we face. We have to deal with the situation we have, which is that there are no new housing resources. I think through an emphasis on work and helping people work uh, more strongly and earn more and move up the ladder, supporting families in their desire to move into uh, the community and then helping them once in their, they're in the community so they don't have to come back to shelter. All these efforts combined can make a reduction in the census. It will be different kind of work than we're used to doing. It may be harder at some level because you don't have a resource that you can give away and then um, you have to invest, continue to invest every day in, in very hard casework and working with families and supporting them all the time. But I think we can make progress and I think the fact that we're not having that discussion but we continue to get pulled back into a discussion in a, a, of a world that doesn't exist hurts our ability to make progress because we're not having a discussion about the real issues facing our families and the real ways we can support them today. But I, I guess I wonder on the work front, um, I mean, the, the you know, median um, income and certainly the, you know, the, the wages of those at the low end, I mean, you know this as well as I do, um, are extremely meager. Um, and, and I wonder not at all to argue against the uh, the virtues of working, um, but that if that you know if that alone, and again I, I keep coming back to this right forty thousand you know person mountain right of, of homeless, not to mention you know whatever the potential population is uh, that, that that you know could come in doubled up and the like, um, is that really a way? I mean, can you do that? I mean, I know the you know the welfare rental subsidies are remain extremely low. Um, can you really hope to tackle, uh, you know, sort of use that as, as the, if you will, the main way of tackling this problem? Well, again, a, a couple things I would say. First, you're right that the entry-level income for, for many families is not where we want it to be. 
Um, the most families, um, when they start, when they leave the shelter system, they're, they're, um, or when they start working, uh, their wage is somewhat over $9 an hour. Um, but that's why I think our efforts need to be uh, focused on trying to raise that and to help them get, get uh, continually to invest in them so that their income can grow. Um, when you look at the city's wealth of support services, food stamps, public health insurance, child care, the earned income tax credit, even a job that uh, starts at $9 an hour pays well over $11 or $12 an hour when you factor in the uh, additional income and support that's available. So right from the start, I think people do have a strong incentive to go to work, and they're in a position that uh, they can make a start. We need to help them and put in place services to help them grow that income. That's the point. That if we get stuck in the debate about whether people can work and whether they should go to work or whether they need re years of remediation to go to work, that is a false debate. People go to work. They want to go to work. 20,000 people have gone to work in a little more than two years. So let's accept that they can go to work and let's focus the debate on how to improve their income. This has been something that I've seen in the welfare reform debate nationally too. Democrats don't want to touch the issue because they're afraid of, of reopening it. Republicans don't want to touch the issue because they don't know what to say. And in the end, the people who need to have their income grow, welfare reform has proven that people can go to work. It hasn't proven that we can help them move up the economic ladder. That's the debate we need to be having. And to, to be constantly dragged back into the first issue is a disservice to helping people move up the ladder. Look, I understand that you're not the mayor, you're the commissioner of homeless services, but there is this, it's an interesting moment because, right, I mean, I believe that the, the mayor's budget is going to call for reasonably substantial cuts in, or maybe, or maybe point of view, unreasonably, but substantial cuts in um, daycare and in uh, after school programs. And uh, I am struck as, as you're talking that, that, you know, these are some of the lifelines for the, the exactly the clients you're, you're talking about, or the New Yorkers you're talking about? Well, the mayor's budget preserves the commitment to the extent that our resources will allow it. Uh, we, are, we are in a position where state and federal money have been cut, where the city has made reasonable proposals that could reduce other expenses, such as pension expenses going forward, and all of those um, proposals have fallen, unfortunately, on deaf ears. We don't have the federal money we want. We haven't gotten to the extent of pension relief that the, men, the mayor had proposed. Uh, other changes have not happened. So we do have to live within the means uh, that we are, the resources that we're provided. And so there have been some cuts. I think the city still, I know the city still does far more than anyone else and far more than the minimum required by law in terms of providing a commitment to people who leave welfare for work. Uh, we all would like to do more, but we have to have the money to do it, and we have to have the money to do that and to improve our public schools and to maintain public safety and to make our parks clean and to pick up the trash and all the other services that we all depend on. There are no non-essential services in the city budget, and that's the problem. Commissioner, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, so I want the four folks from the panel to come on up. <laughs> Closest to me is Stephen Banks. He is the attorney in charge, in ch attorney in chief, I think is the official title, the Legal Aid Society, and uh, made his name working on the litigation around homeless family shelters in New York City and is still working on that. Um, Emily Youssef is Vice Chair of New York City Housing Authority Board and former President of the City's Housing Development Corporation and a former Executive at J.P. Morgan on the housing development side. Patrick Marquis is Senior Policy Analyst at the Coalition for, homeless, for the Homeless and has also been working on advocacy around the City's shelter system for, I guess, about 17 years now. And Catherine Trapani is an analyst at New Destiny Housing, where she works on domestic, uh, shelter for uh, domestic violence survivors and on services for those women as well. Um, 
you know, why don't we like everybody shift down a little <laughs> bit so that you have a little more room. Uh, <laughs> Uh, hi. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with Steve as you're closest to me. Um, Is that good? Or? <laughs> um, you know, the commissioner, it seems to me, raises a fair point, which is that there's been this now three-decade-long, four-decade-long battle. Um, in many ways, the, the, the shelter system itself is a better and more humane place, uh, not perfect, but a better, more humane place than certainly it was when, you know, I remember going into the EAUs in the, you know, 1990. Um, and the city has continued to build housing, <coughs> albeit not, much of it not for homeless people directly, but has continued to build housing at a level unprecedented in American history. Um, and yet, there's 40,000 people in the shelter. Um, and, I, and I guess I wonder what your thoughts are on, you know, is to take nothing away from the, in many cases, very important lawsuits that you and others have bought over the years and fought for. Uh, but is there sort of a need to think differently about this right now? Well, I learned a lot from the commissioner's presentation. And what I learned was that if only the homeless advocates would stop criticizing uh, the city policy, we wouldn't have 40,000 people in the shelter system. I mean, stripped to its essentials, that's basically what he said. And what's interesting, Michael, is that for a number of years uh, over the last, uh, it, you know, during the current administration, this criticism, you know, too much litigation, too much litigation. And as you know, we settled the McCain litigation four years ago. And there actually hasn't been any litigation involving homeless families with children since December 2008 when we settled that litigation with a permanent right to shelter for homeless families with children. Uh, the only litigation that we've had involving family homelessness was to challenge the cutoff of 16,000 families who had advantage rent supplements because we felt that it was a precipitous cutoff of 16,000 families. And we were arguing in court just about a month ago, two months ago, that the city shouldn't cut off the remaining subsidies. And essentially the argument from the city lawyer, a lawyer who I've litigated with for years, I have great respect for, and he, you know, as a lawyer, you have to argue your case. He basically argued that it would be cheaper to have the families in the shelter system because the state uh, uh, and, and federal government pick up the tab there, and they don't with advantage. So the underlying criticism, like too much advocacy, too much litigation, too much this, too much that, I think is really misplaced, and, and we, I, I thought we were going to get a, 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 a clarion call from the commissioner about new city housing policy involving homelessness, uh, potentially some new thinking about permanent housing, and instead we basically got a, you know, a, a chastising for, for uh, saying, hey, you know what, this isn't really something that helps our clients. So I'd like to actually bring it back to that, because I think that might be helpful. You know, Yvonne McCain who was a named plaintiff in this litigation uh, we brought years ago, she died over the past year, asked one question when she came in, and still the challenge to all people in government, uh, whether you're the city, the state, or the federal government. She said when she originally came and we, we got her shelter, she said, oh, that's great, I need a roof over my head, but why is it that the government can pay thousands of dollars for my shelter, but for a couple hundred dollars to subsidize my rent? And that question just hangs over this whole presentation. And, you know, the fact that some community group, not the Legal Aid Society and not the Coalition for the Homeless, challenged the opening of a shelter in Chelsea, I don't think really answers Yvonne McCain's question. Or the fact that some people were troubled by the fact that there might have been a human experimentation issue with who got prevention services and who didn't, I don't think that really answers Yvonne McCain's question. And I certainly don't think an argument about whether or not uh, we should just shut up and leave people alone answers that question. I hate being but the role I, of Cassandra. <clears throat> but I, wa I wonder, though, um, if that's, <laughs> I mean, when, I, when you talk, and I guess, Emily, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts as well here. Um, when you talk to city, people have done city housing for many years. That is, create, create the housing that has rebuilt so many neighborhoods. Um, 
The, I mean, there's two, two important, it seems to me, issues are raised. One is that to reach, you know, that, that yes, you can reach somebody who's homeless, who's at the sort of rock bottom economically, but that that requires an enormously deep subsidy. An enormously deep subsidy that then means you're not going to produce four units of housing, you're going to produce one and a half. Or, I mean, I'm, I was making these numbers up. Um, and secondly, that you have a reasonable, and again, it seems to me based on, on the history of city housing policy over 30 years, a reasonable concern as to tenant and income mix in, a, in any one place. That if you get an over-concentration in a particular house of any one sort of economic group, you have you potential problems. Absolutely. So I'm interested, and, and your quick thoughts, and then we'll, then I, I would like Emily I, to. I think you're right, but I also think that three other administrations, and this administration at the beginning, uh, tackled that problem. And yes, there are ups and downs over the years, but more or less, you look at the Koch administration, and I'm sure if he was here, he would laugh that I'm citing him with great uh, relish. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, he had the most massive relocation of, of families from the shelter system of, of all time in any jurisdiction, and there were mistakes made, and then the Dinkins administration, the Giuliani administration corrected some of them, and the Bloomberg administration at the beginning, uh, you know, was trying to address some of them. But nobody said you could do it without any housing, and that's what I still find stunning, and that we actually really haven't, didn't talk about that with the commissioner, because I'd like to have a discussion about how we're going to get some housing, not how we're going to live with no housing. Um, say a few things um, about that. First of all, uh, a couple of facts about NYCHA. Is it? Okay. A couple of facts about NYCHA, I think, which is important for everyone to get. We have um, 178,000 apartments. We have a population of over 400,000. We administer 95,000 Section 8 vouchers, which is another 250,000. We have a wait list. The, the commissioner had said seven years for public housing. We have 161,000 people on the wait list. Section 8, we have 122,000. Our vacancy rate is 0.8%. Every year when we do have some turnover, about almost 20% of the turnover goes to people that are referred from the city through DHS, HPD, you know, various city agencies. We have um, currently in public housing, almost 20% are formerly homeless, as well as our Section 8 vouchers. Almost every new construction project that is completed by HDC and HPD, which is mixed income, which is the bulk, and I was at HDC when a lot of mm -hmm. these programs started, um, contain a requirement for 10 or 20 percent for formerly homeless. So the city is very active and very aware of trying to do mixed income developments because they do believe that that is one of the best ways as you know, you had just addressed to try to economically integrate buildings, and that it's beneficial all around. The you know the second thing is there the funding is just from the federal government is incredibly cut over the last ten years. Our operating budget has been cut over about six hundred and sixty million dollars, and our capital budget has been cut cumulatively over the last 10 years, 900 million. Now that's huge amounts of money. We also have to spend a lot of money, frankly, you know, maintaining our buildings. And that, you know, our buildings are like 70 years old. The amount of maintenance is really through the roof. So we do try to address the homeless situation. There's no way we're going to be able to, you know, take care of everything. And I, I wish, we all wish we really could. But, you know, top priorities, homeless is one of the top priorities. So we're, you know, women that are victims of domestic violence. So are homeless vets. So are um, people that live in uninhabitable tenements who need out. It's, you know, I really think the way to take this discussion, and, and I think that's what the commissioner was saying, is not that people shouldn't complain, because without people 
voice is being raised, nothing will change. But I think it's more, let's think about new ways to address the issues. So let me, if I could, that's, a, that, that's great. Give me one, you know, for instance, the area of public housing. I mean, how, could, how might we, if you're thinking about the homeless right. question, um, you know, what, what might be one sort of new way of thinking about that? I think um, a lot of it, which you get a lot of resistance to, Citizens Housing and Planning Commission Council, which is a think tank for housing issues, did a report and has gotten a lot of publicity on it, and that is alternative ways of building housing. And I know uh, Common Ground, or the, the group that formerly was mm -hmm. Common Ground, has spent a lot of effort on this t as well. And that are, you know, building smaller units, units that do have windows and bathrooms and, you know, um, a bed, bedroom area, but making them smaller than city code normally allows and make them into transition housing where people can stay. I think that's a great way to go. You have to get, um, you know, and there's a lot of discussions going on and the city is seriously looking at if that is something that's feasible to be able to do. So I think that's what the commissioner was referring to as far as, you know, changes and mm -hmm. building code policies. And I think if people really want more housing, then the concentration and the voices should really be directed to Washington to say more Section 8 vouchers and do not destroy public housing. Well, and also the, the state played its role right in advantage, I mean, in sort of walking away from... Yes, that was, that was, yes, but that was one program, and when you look at the bulk of funding for any kind of housing support, it comes from the federal government. Well, particularly for public housing. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, all the money comes from the federal right. government. Uh, Patrick, and, and I should say, you know, as we go along, if people want to jump in, I, I don't want to be the, the lone arbiter of this. I mean, I'm serious. It would be terrific just to have, you know, people jumping in. But Patrick, I guess I'm, I'm interested in, in your reflections on both what Steve and Emily raised, as well as, you know, I mean, if, if you were to look at some areas, you've done this for an awfully long time uh, and done some terrific work, what would be, so, you know, what might you do differently? What might the city do differently? Um, just your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I think, is this working? I think, uh, like Steve, I was a bit struck by the tone of the commissioner's remarks and, uh, and just a couple of the, so the words that sort of, uh, sort of resounded through his, his remarks. And one was this kind of idea of new versus old. Uh, and then the other was the idea of consensus. So I'll come back to the consensus. But it's funny, we don't actually look at things in terms of new versus old. Um, I think there's a sort of a fetishism of like the idea that, you know, new or thinking outside the box or all those things are always the way you have to go. I think we look at things in terms of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, there's enormous and overwhelming research evidence, experience, history showing that what works for homeless families exiting the shelter system in terms of staying out of shelter, in terms of maintaining their housing stability, is long-term permanent housing subsidies. Uh, the Bloomberg administration itself commissioned a study by the Veer Institute um, back in 2004, 2005, and what they found is that families that exited shelter with public housing, um, about 2% of them became homeless again after many years. Those that exited with Section 8 vouchers, about 3% of them became homeless after many years. Families that exited shelter with no subsidies whatsoever, um, more than a third and sometimes as many as half ended up experiencing homelessness again. Uh, and the experience of the Advantage program itself, we heard the commissioner say, was that you know 30% uh, of the families ended up back in shelter after they lost their subsidy. So we see, we know exactly what worked. In fact, the city itself had commissioned a study that shows exactly what works. So then contrast that with, uh, and I very much agree with the commissioner on this, we need to talk about uh, debates about realities and resources that are available. So let's talk about public housing. Uh, we have 180,000, almost 180,000 units of public housing. Uh, each year there's turnover in that system. Last year the city placed 5,600 families into public housing. You want to know how many homeless families were placed into public housing? Less than 100. At a time of record homelessness, no, I'm less sorry, than 100 that's families. Not, that's not true. This is the city's own, these no, are the I, city's. I, 
I have the statistics. You have to look at the city's management report from the Department of Homeless Services, how many families are relocated. You might have, have your own records, but they put that up publicly of how many okay. people they well, relocated. Yeah. So yeah. so so can I just finish? Can I just finish? Okay, you finish, the then we'll city, let Emily so the respond. City's, the city's <laughs> policy, as Steve said, under Mayors Koch, Dinkins, Giuliani, and under Mayor Bloomberg in his first term, was, in our view, a reasonable and rational one that recognizes that there are scarce federal housing resources that there's enormous need out there in the community, but that the neediest households deserve to have some of that very successful uh, and proven housing assistance in order to leave shelter and stay out of shelter. Uh, and so what the city used to do is target a quarter, a third of public housing vacancies each year uh, to families in the shelter system using a priority system. So this talk about a, a waiting list that's seven years long or that's 100,000 households long, simply is, a, is sort of misleading. I mean, it's not a waiting list like when you go to the deli and you pick a number and I'm uh, number 12 in line, so I'm going to be the 12th person served. People with different priorities, with different needs, are given a different sort of, uh, sort of place on the waiting list. So it's actually a series of multiple waiting lists. It used to be what the city did was uh, the, the homeless services agency would refer a certain number of homeless families from the shelter system or from other shelters over to the waiting list and those families got a place in public housing. And again, that housing worked for those families. And as a bonus, it actually saved the city and the state taxpayer money, because that money, $36,000 a year that's spent to shelter a family, uh, was instead being picked up by the federal government for permanent housing. Right, so but, better but, for children, better for families, better for the taxpayer. Okay, if, if okay. I could just quick. Uh, okay, to... um, actually last year was 16% of those units, 935 of new admissions were formerly homeless families. And we had the statistics, I'm not sure what statistics DH, you know, H goes. Remember, we're, we're not a city agency. We're a state authority funded by the feds who is a component of, you know, New York City. But I'm telling you, we have on our, we do have a real wait list. And if you don't believe us, then the next time we start calling people from the wait list, maybe you want to hear how happy they are to actually get an apartment. There are real human beings. I mean, it does provide, you know, decent, yeah. safe housing. So. It's not, and it is something that actually is one of our priorities. We do have a lot. We have women who, you know, domestic violence. We have protect, witness protection programs from the NYPD. You, the amount of priorities that we have are actually immense, and we try to do our best you know, and, and I think the real answer is, once again, if you look at federal policy right now across the country, it is the destruction of public housing. And you could go anywhere, Atlanta, you can go to Detroit, you can go to Chicago, you can go to Baltimore, and the public housing is being demolished and they're building mixed income housing in its place. And the truth is they usually only replace about one third of the public housing units. That means, frankly, you know, we're under attack as well as every public housing. So my suggestion is rather than saying, oh, NYCHA, you're not doing enough when I've told you how, how many people we actually serve, the challenges we face from an economic basis, is the, the call for more funding and what we can do really has to go to Washington. Washington limits, based on the 1986 Tax Reform Act, how many municipal bonds can be sold to build affordable housing. Okay. They limit how many 9% tax credits are given. And without those things, it is impossible to build affordable housing given how expensive in New York City it is to build any type of housing. Okay. Can well, I, I would like to get to Catherine. Just, just I'll, I'll get back to you. Let me just, uh, yes. Well, first of all, I'd just like to say that that I agree. We need to be, 
we need to be advocating for more resources for NYCHA. I absolutely agree. Now, we spoke a little bit about the priority for victims of domestic violence, so I just want to touch on that a little bit. Um, in domestic violence shelters, which, by the way, are separate from the Department of Homeless Services shelter, so I want to just make that clear, um, domestic violence shelters are run by the Human Resources Administration, and they actually are time limited. There's no right to DV shelter. You have to be out within 135 days. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the precursor to what I'm about to say regarding NYCHA. Um, NYCHA does have a domestic violence priority. To qualify for that priority, um, you need extensive documentation. Less than 30% of the residents residing in domestic violence shelters actually have the documentation required to qualify for that priority. It's very criminal justice heavy. But just put, putting that aside for a moment, those that do qualify for that domestic violence priority, less than 1%, less than half of 1%, get placed in NYCHA public housing directly from the shelter system. And that's with one of the highest priorities available. So the wait list issue is a real one. Um, so what I would say is that we applaud NYCHA for doing what it does, but I do think that there are tweaks that could be made in NYCHA's policy that would make it more accessible to the neediest people. And so a homeless survivor of domestic violence who does not have a right to shelter, that needs a safe place to go, I really urge NYCHA to look at that documentation criteria and consider domestic violence shelter residency amongst other things um, in order to help more people a, qualify, and then B, we have to look at the processing time. Even with the, one of the highest priorities available, my experience is that the length of time it takes to get placed in an apartment is at least a year with the, with the families that I work with. And that's with the highest priority, and that's simply too long. We can't wait. So to get back to sort of the original discussion of, well, what now? You know, I agree, NYCHA needs to be made available to the neediest, but, but we need something else and we need it in the interim when, when we're working on this timeline that is so incredibly narrow for people that are not only homeless, but are in imminent danger. That's the criteria to get into so, so let's move away from NYCHA just for a second. What would be that something else? Catherine, and then, I'll, and then I will get back to you, Patrick, I promise. We need a subsidy. I mean, you know, I, I, I was listening to the, the commissioner's remarks, and I understand that there are challenges and there are resource issues, but there are choices to be made. Um, you know, there are options to raising revenue that are often unexplored. We need a subsidy. I think New York City has an obligation to, to people to provide them with safe permanent homes, and I don't believe that it is reasonable to ask a family to choose between homelessness and abuse. So we, we need a subsidy. Now, that's not to say that I disagree with the commissioner regarding the idea of rewarding work and all of these other things. I think that's all phenomenal, but when you've got 135 days in shelter, you are a victim of trauma, and you are forced to cut ties with all of your resources. Your, your child care provider is no longer safe. You're, if you were employed prior to coming to shelter, it may not be safe to go back to that job. It's unreasonable to expect every single person to be able to return to the workforce immediately and earn a living wage at that. So. Might something like this, this doubled up housing you know, option, I mean, but in a, in a more humane way, be, be a way out? Um, you know, maybe. I think that when you're, you're dealing with victims of trauma, again, there's a lot of issues with trust. There's a lot of issues with building relationships um, to make sure that families with children are safe. So if you're moving into a shared living situation, it, it can create problems because of mental health issues and other things. But also, just in terms of the healing model, I, I'm really reluctant to embrace a housing model that requires codependency. When you're healing from domestic violence, one of, one of the most important things is to be able to feel empowered so that you know, you're not beholden to your abuser any longer and, and you're on your own and you're gonna make it for yourself and your kids. Now, if your success is contingent upon another family's success, I think that that is a little bit risky mm -hmm. for this particular population. Now, Patrick. Yes. <laughs> no, I just, I guess I just wanted to return, I guess, to the second point I alluded to is sort of the idea of consensus. The commissioner talked a lot, I think, in his remarks about uh, the need for robust debate and about consensus. And I think actually we're at an interesting moment here. Um, the mayor and the city council are negotiating a budget right now. And you have uh, put before the, the mayor's administration a plan by the city council speaker and the city council that talks about a way forward. And it's not a pie in the sky way forward. It's not a way forward 
frankly, that's going to solve all of the problems of homelessness, but it's a way forward that would lead to thousands and thousands of homeless children and families in shelter uh, being able to move into permanent housing. What the City Council speakers proposed is a plan where 2,500 public housing apartments would be targeted to families in shelter. Uh, that means 2,500 families, 5,000 children, perhaps, would be moved out of the shelter system in the, in the next year. That, sec that a portion of Section 8 vouchers, when they become available in, in the future, also be set aside for families in shelter. And that the city, the city work with the city council to create a new rental assistance program modeled on the Section 8 program, which we know works, that would help 1,000 families a year move from shelter into permanent housing. And this is a real world plan. This is a plan that also is fiscally responsible because it would reduce the amount of city and state tax dollars going into the shelter system, would reduce homelessness, and would help a lot of kids and families get out of the shelter system into permanent housing. And I guess my the question I would have asked the commissioner is why not? Like really, what would be the reason to say no to that? You've, you've got a consensus from the city council, you've got a consensus from the advocates, you've got a consensus from any service providers who've also written to the mayor and the city council advocating for exactly this plan. You've got a consensus in terms of academic research, evidence well, of what worked what if, under but, previous mayors. But, but this is if, something that could work right, but right what now. If the, but what of the commissioner's point that, look, you may not have loved the Advantage program. Let's say 30, uh, and I'm not going to wade into whether, you know, he's right, you're right on the percentage. Let's say 30% ended up back homeless. 70% didn't. And, you know, I think that he takes the view that the advocacy community helped sink a program that, you know, was at, at the very, perhaps imperfect, but that was housing people. Yes. I mean, I actually would, would, would say that the debate that Patrick is laying out that the city council would like to have in the budget process now is the one that the city didn't want to have in the state budget process a year ago, and we see what we got to. You can blame us, or, or you can blame the state, you can blame the city, you can blame whoever you want, but the reality is that um, based upon the fact that this court order was lifted, there's 8,000 families that are gonna get evicted because of advantage right now, and you know that maybe that's the past, but we don't have the present. You don't get an opportunity to relive the past a lot, and we're at that moment again. We're a legislative body, the city council, you know, co-equal branch of government, is saying, we've got a plan, and we can fit it into our budget model. And yeah, the commissioner come forward and say, yeah, it should only be for this, or it shouldn't be open-ended, or my data shows this, and the coalition legal aid say that. That's a debate. But right now, the debate is nothing or nothing. And I think that there are a lot of people that would like to join a debate that would say, okay, the council's saying, uh, you know, for Koch, Dinkins, and Giuliani, three different mayors, all said, uh, with, with respect to the housing authority, it's really not you know, who they let in. What those three mayors said was, it's who we prioritize you take from the shelter system, because that's really what you were talking about, Michael. How do you drive down those numbers? And that's really what those three mayors said, let's drive down the numbers. And one of the things I have tremendous credit to the ma this mayor for is that he actually said, and, and no mayor really said it, is we're going to reduce the numbers of people in the shelter system by a percentage. That was a terrific debate changer, if you will. The, the, the problem that we see is how they implement it and the policies of taking away priority for the housing authority and the policies of taking away uh, uh, other things that, that made it impossible to reach that goal. But okay, we have a reset. And we're at a moment where a big difference could, could be made. And what my concern is, is I've seen this with mayoral changes before. One mayoral administration sort of gets to its finish line and turns over to the next one a very difficult situation. I see Nancy Waxstein here. She'll remember the transition from Koch to, to Dinkins, and I see some other people remember the transition from Dinkins to Giuliani and then Giuliani to and each one of them. There was sort of a failure policy at the end, and it became much worse for homeless families in the immediate months afterwards. And I think we have a chance in the city now to make a big difference by really actually embracing the debate that's on the table in the city budget. And maybe it'll be the city council's plan. I hope it will be. We'll certainly advocate for it. The city might have a different view, but it shouldn't end up with being nothing at the end of this debate. But is it reasonable to, given the very harsh climate at the federal level, given the not too much less harsh climate at the state level, I mean, you have a Democratic governor who, as near as I can see, walked away from uh, a, a big program, um, 
that again, however imperfectly, was housing quite a few families, is it reasonable to think that that can all be done at the state level and relying on, as Emily was talking about, a public housing resource that surely looks better than very rundown tenements and the like, but you know, ain't in such great shape itself. Well, I, I'm gonna take a page from the commissioner, dealing with the realities that we have, with the issues in Washington and the issues in Albany, <coughs> this is a reality that could make a difference now that makes use of available resources that the city could control, i.e. priority for the housing authority and use of a city rent subsidy. Uh, I don't know if this is gonna get me uh, uh, applause or booed. There are a lot of people in the audience I can see I've deposed over the years, uh, <laughs> along with the commissioner. And most depositions had a question, I see councils here so you can instruct me if I'm wrong, most depositions always had a question of how are you gonna come into compliance? And the questions always had, it's a combination of prevention, combination of having available habitable shelter, and a, and a combination of having a way to move people out. And so that wisdom, which isn't our wisdom as advocates, but the wisdom of four mayoral administrations is you need a combination of the three. And if the third can only happen because the two other branches of government, the federal and the state, aren't helping, you can't have a right to shelter in the city that makes, that's meaningful unless there's some way to move people out. And that's really, I think, the question. And we can you know, shake our fists at, at Washington and shake our fists at Albany, but we've got the reality every night of 41,000 people in the shelter system, and the number's growing, tremendous cost, we've got to start moving people out. Yeah, or no. we're going to have more litigation about people being denied well, shelter, me, which nobody get, wants. Let, let me get Emily, and then I'll, then I'll get you. Well, you know, one of the issues that, um, that has, we, NYCHA has a problem with um, apartments that have a lot of elderly seniors who are in apartments where they had their family, you know, and has left, and they have three or four bedroom apartments, and they're, we're trying to move them. You know, we're building, we've been working with HPD and HCC, trying to move them into new, you know, um, senior buildings, trying to get them to move to one bedrooms and move overcrowded families, which we also have a large number of overcrowding mean a two bedroom with six people, you know, living in there. I mean, that's, you know, federally designated overcrowded that you're not supposed to have that, right? And we can't get them to move. And every time we try and say, you know, it's in your lease and it's great you raised your family here and we need you to move, then we get villainized and sometimes sued by people who then, <laughs> who then, you know, say, oh my God, look what you're doing to the elderly. And we don't want to hurt the elderly, but, you know, we're trying to accommodate families. So I think it's it's very easy to say this priority or that priority has to come first when the real issue is, as I said, you have to look at federal policy. The current administration is a, you know, democratic administration that's supposed to be very friendly to these issues and has done, you know, nothing except agree and put forth budgets that cut all types of financing aids to any type of housing, not just ours, but you know, all types of affordable housing. So I, those are really the, you know, to me, where the issues are, you know. Um, and I think, it, I think you have to be realistic about that. And with all the other people who've been on the waiting list, people on the waiting list have been on five, six, 10 years, and they recertify every year and say they still desperately need the housing. So you can't just tell them, well, you're not that important anymore. I mean, you can, but I'm not, I'm not sure well, what. what if you were to go up, as Steve suggests, by some, you know, some relatively small percentage and, and let in more, you know, put a homeless stream a little bit bigger into that? You know, we, uh, it's, it's always something that people want to do, and we get pressure from every other group that is you know, um, their interests are not just homeless, but there's interest for other issues who say the same thing. I mean, it's, it, and believe me, I would like to take them all in, you know? If I had a big enough house, they could all come live with me. But I mean, you know, you can't, it's not, it's not realistic. What has to be realistic is you need to attack where the issue 
the it needs more funding it needs more funding from the federal government when you look at the cost of building one affordable housing unit in New York City it's usually about two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars per unit and that does not include the city giving its real estate tax abatements, which it does. It does not include the costs that the federal government considers by issuing the bonds, tax exempt bonds, and the amount of revenue they're losing. That does not include um, the tax credits and the amount of revenue they're losing. It does not include any loss for um, you know, transfer tax and mortgage recording tax. These units, every unit of affordable housing, when you look at all of those costs, is much more than just the 275. So people have to be real, you know, realistic about what the costs are. And you can't just, you can demand certainly whatever you want, but how do you fund it? Thank you. Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, look, I think no one would disagree that we've got a Congress, particularly a House leadership that is you know, antithetical to the needs of public housing and affordable housing. I think we have a presidential candidate who talked recently about eliminating the Department of Housing and Urban Development, possibly. Um, so no one, no one would dispute that. Uh, it doesn't change the reality as we sit here right now that we do have 180,000 units of public housing, that 5,600 of them turn over every year, or are going to turn over, and that some of that housing, as the city council has proposed, could be made available to significantly reduce homelessness to save thousands of children from the hardships of homelessness and that that could happen right now and actually save city and state taxpayer money. That's sort of real world practical stuff. Then let's, com let's contrast that with pie in the sky stuff. This notion of changes in building codes and zoning regulations and the kinds of things that literally have been discussed in all the time that I've been doing affordable housing and homelessness advocacy um, you know, proposals from CHPC and other groups. These kinds of ideas have been out there for years. Uh, one, they would take years before they could be enacted if they were. Two, that housing that could get built under those kinds of reforms would take years more to be developed. And three, it probably wouldn't still be affordable to the poorest families in the city. It just wouldn't be. Uh, we heard the commissioner say that families, working homeless families, are making $9 an hour, working 30 hours a week. They're earning $1,100 a month in income, $1,200 a month in income. These are families that are making $13,000 a year in income. They just can't afford those kinds of rents. They yeah, can afford guess, rents of four or $500 maybe a month. But, let me, but, but that but, housing isn't going to be built at those at Right, but price. I guess what so, I wonder about is... So that is, to me is pie in the sky. But is housing the... I mean, there's sort of two questions, right, that often come up in this. One is, is housing the only sort of problem here is that we're not the only problem is that the the the, the preeminent problem and I would say yes the tw we lost 20 percent over since 2005 according to the census bureau we've lost 20 percent of all apartments in the city affordable to low-income families what the federal government just des describes as low-income families so we're we're facing a game of musical chairs where we're the chairs are being pulled out each year it should be no surprise that we have rising numbers of homeless families homeless households in the city facing that environment. So in the midst of that environment, to have a debate on homeless policy that says, well, we're not going to do anything on housing. There's no housing assistance for families. It's just going to be about work. Even leaving aside the fact that we're facing the worst economy that we've had in decades is just really like kind of not, not acknowledging what the real problems are. Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I think housing is obviously the core issue, but poverty is, is an issue. Housing is not an issue unless poverty is an issue. So I, I think that we also need to look at other types of supports that make it more manageable for people to, to manage the high cost of housing. Because as Patrick stated, the, the incomes for most of the folks that are residing in the shelters, even the ones that are working, are simply not high enough even for affordable housing. Now, New Destiny is an affordable housing developer, and we do have a 50% set aside in our buildings for homeless survivors of domestic violence. But the only way we're able to accomplish that is with assistance from HPD, DHCR, because those units have some subsidy coming in. And it's, it's extremely challenging for us. Um, so, you know, when, when I hear about, and, and this was touched on earlier, but I just want to bring it up again, you know, the, the cuts to childcare that you brought up, I think that that is 
extremely troubling when, when you're thinking about homeless families. That, that's, that's a lifeline. So we need to, to be looking at the issue of, of homelessness and poverty more holistically and making sure that all of the supports are available for folks that are, are struggling to make ends meet and access to public benefits is an issue. And I mean, I think that poverty is what you really have to look at and breaking the cycle because, you know, we have some families that they're the third or fourth generation that are in public housing and public housing wasn't, con you know, conceived to do that. It's supposed to be safe haven and then hopefully, you know, the next generation will go to school, get an education, get a trade and be able to move up. But that isn't, we have tenants who've been there, you know, a very long time. Some of them are not capable. They don't, they lack the life skills or the ability to move on and we can't kick them out to make room for other people. Also our, remember our vacancy rate is really low. The number of move outs every year gets, you know, is also fluctuates, it's not always, and the vacancy rate in New York City now is below 2%. I mean, you know, you with all of the, the great things where, you know, you can wish for, you have to be realistic about what you have. And I think the only realistic thing is to get more funding, to look at building small units, which I don't think the rents are gonna be as high as you're saying, because if you are more densely packed, then in fact the rents for each unit will be lower because that's how it works. Well, let me let, let me just and, and then I guess we should probably open it up to the uh, to the crowd uh, in just a second. But I, I guess I'm interested. We've had this unprecedented housing program creating low and moderate income housing now. And it's run since, what, 1987, more or less, 1988. Um, e even putting aside, and, and, and it does seem to me particularly um, problematic to have no, <laughs> no, no way out of a shelter system into housing. But let's put that aside. I mean, if you were to go back two or three or four or five years ago, you're 25, 20 years into a program that has produced you know, hundreds of thousands of units of, of housing for people at the lower end of the economic spectrum. And yet the homeless population, while not as high as certainly as today, certainly didn't, you know, I mean, it isn't as if it went down to 10,000. And I guess what I, I wonder is, okay, so does that get you there? Does it get you there to, I mean, undoubtedly, it, it seems to me, you pull it down from 40 to some number less than that, and that's certainly, that, that, that's real. That's a lot of those thousands of families. But is it an, I mean, what's going on? We're producing all this housing for all these many years, and yet. Well, I mean, just some numbers. I mean, the Koch program, the Housing New York program, uh, created or rehabbed 150,000 apartments over 10 years. Fully 10% of them, 15,000 of them, went to the homeless. It was very much what Steve was talking about in the late 80s, uh, early 90s. You saw uh, dramatic numbers of homeless families and kids moving out of shelters, often from decrepit welfare hotels, into permanent housing. And again, mistakes were made. It was done quickly, but uh, it was done in an effective way. Uh, that number tapered off uh, in the second Giuliani term. And then under Mayor Bloomberg, uh, his plan, while it it, it proposes to create more units, far fewer of them will go to the homeless. And actually the percentage of those units that go to the poorest families is smaller than what you saw in the Koch plan. It's not to take away from the, you know, the ambitions of these programs. Look, New York City is unique in the country as in many other things just because of its size and its financial resources and being able to do that kind of investment. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that the structural uh, trends are that rents are going up, across the city while incomes are stagnating or falling for the lowest income families. That gap is getting bigger. We're losing affordable units. So I guess the answer is it would be worse without those things, but it's not enough. Um, I, would, I would just say that, you know, with the affordable units that are being built under the mayor's plan, in, in mixed income and in the ones that are all low income, 10 or 20% are 
are in fact constructed for homeless, you know, for formerly homeless um, families. So that, I mean, it is happening, but again, we, they are limited. When, um, if there is a unit available, a building gets completed and they do a lottery and they literally do a lottery that is overseen by like three different agencies to be sure it's all on, you know, the up and up, which I think you need to do. But for a building that has 100 units, they will get 3,000 applications. I mean, so it's more than just the homeless who need decent housing. Okay, Steve, you had a, a, looked to me like you had a thought, and then we'll, I think, move to questions. Right, I, I mean, I, I, I hate to say this because, um, you know, seen it, you've seen this hyperbole, but I think it's really true. If you came from Mars, and you were told that there's one agency called the Homeless Agency, which says it has the best eligibility procedure, you know, imaginable. We could debate that, but I'm going to accept it as true. And that it targets shelter to only the very neediest people, that there's no other place they could be. And we can be sure that we're using our public dollars correctly in terms of provision of shelter because they don't make mistakes. They find the right people who have no other place to go. Now we have another agency called the Housing Agency, and the people that are homeless don't get prioritized to go into the housing agency. Someone would say that public policy doesn't make any sense. One agency says, we've found the neediest people in the city, and another agency says, well, those needy people don't get a priority. That's part of the reason why these numbers are going up. The other reason why the numbers are going up is we're losing units as fast as we're getting them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, talk about the Rent Guidelines Board and all that process, that's like a whole other uh, symposium, which I know Andrew's ready to take on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you sort of look at the numbers that are being, de you know, deregulated and becoming unaffordable, it's sort of like you're bailing water because you have a confluence of different governmental policies which don't operate together. So you're putting a lot of money into building new units and you're losing them and, the, and they're going out of the stock. And so if you go back and look at the zero-sum game, you're getting a, 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 an advantage in terms of numbers, but you're still resulting in people who are in deep poverty and all the statistics that you've detailed in your columns about increasing poverty and so on and so forth, and you don't have enough units to make up for that. Uh, and obviously it would be much worse if we didn't have those programs. But what's missing is the linkages between what is, government, what is one government agency saying and what is another government agency saying? And that's not the responsibility of the two agencies. That's the responsibility of the units of government overseeing them, which is what I think the council priority uh, proposal is aimed at trying to bridge. Like, what is the you know, 20,000 uh, feet uh, view of what we're actually doing here? And again, um, I, I don't think it's correct to say we don't allow, you know, we don't have a priority for homeless. Uh, we do, but I mean, it's not as large as you know, many people would like, and it would be great to get all the groups who want priorities for their various, um, con you know, constituents in a room, and then they can fight it out and tell us what to do. Okay, do we want to take some questions? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Richard Barr. I would have liked to have asked Commissioner Diamond this, but maybe someone else could take a crack at it. <laughs> when he was uh, in the Giuliani administration and helping to implement what that administration called welfare reform, but was essentially reducing the numbers of people on welfare, by the last year of the administration, the then Commissioner of Homeless Services, Martin Osterreich, fa famously said, about all the people flooding the shelters, I couldn't screw the front door any tighter if I tried. And I'm wondering whether part of the reason for that is because so many people were taken off of the welfare system, both then and now. And, and also, just as a, as a follow-up, he said, um, and uh, Ms. Youssef has said that there's no federal and state subsidy money for housing now, but the mayor socializes with President Obama who courts his endorsement. He lobbies the governor over things like releasing uh, teacher evaluation results. Why can't he be lobbying these people intensively for uh, housing subsidy money? Uh. So to, uh, 
Is, is there anyone who would like? I guess. Well, let me ask you, Steve. I mean, <laughs> well, no. Well, I'm thinking. Well, I'm thinking on the welfare, the welfare piece of that. I mean, I'm interested in what you've seen as a uh, a frontline practitioner. Did you play golf with the president, and the mayor? <laughs> <laughs> In fairness, I do know I do know for a fact that city housing officials go down to Washington an awful lot and do an awful lot of and very high city officials. I will say that for them. But go ahead. Uh, not on golf, on on welfare. No, and just, I don't know about golfing. I mean, look, I, as the Wall Street Journal, uh, sorry to mention a rival. <laughs> Detail. I mean, there there are lines in front of welfare centers, uh, you know, earlier this year, which I think sort of bespeaks the dimension of the problem in terms of poverty being the underlying issues. Uh, I, I think that I think the commissioner was right, and I, I want people to keep track of this. I've said he's right on a bunch of times in this. I think he's right on the issue that, you know, the debate about whether you should work or not really actually isn't the debate because people are working. Mm -hmm. um, I think the question as to welfare reform and welfare benefits is whether or not people who really can't work are getting the benefits and are we uh, providing emergency assistance to keep people from being evicted and the lines and all the issues around that I think did have consequences in terms of people being able to get rents, uh, uh, rent arrears paid and, and, and things of that nature. Um, yeah, there's an intersection between welfare policy and homeless policy because if the shelter allowance isn't sufficient to pay your rent and if the shelter allowance even with the FEPS program and all the issues around even getting access to that isn't sufficient to pay your rent, uh, the two programs, again, aren't working together. You have one area of saying, we're not going to give enough to pay your rent, and another area of saying, oh, my God, we have to shelter the people who uh, we're not getting enough to pay the rent. When I started at Legal Aid, uh, which you're not going to ask me to say when, my clients mm -hmm. actually could pay the rent with their welfare uh, rent allowance uh, because that's what the prevailing rents were in the neighborhoods. But that is certainly not the case now. There are people in this audience that can't pay their rents, let alone mm -hmm. my clients on public assistance. Catherine, I just, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm interested in what you see with your clients. Yeah, well, on the way here this morning, I walked past the line for the HRA Center on 14th Street, and it was, I was early, it was before 7 a.m., and there was already 10 people waiting for the building to open. So clearly, we have an issue. Um, and I, I just, you know, I have to agree with, with Steve regarding the, the problems with the rental allowance and the inadequacy of even the FEPS allowance. And, and I, I have to imagine that that, um, is, is adding to the numbers. And for victims of domestic violence in particular, I think there's a lot of problems with the welfare to work rules that can sometimes make them unsafe. And access is an issue. And there's supposed to be universal screening and there's supposed to be waivers <coughs> from, you know, say, for example, the child support requirement. The city is always encouraging people to go after child support as a way out of poverty. For victims <coughs> of domestic violence, if you take your child's father who is also your abuser, to court for child support, that can put you in imminent danger. There are supposed to be waivers available, but those are, are often not granted, not even screened for. So, you know, welfare policy impacts this particularly vulnerable population and it makes it hard for them or dangerous for them to access benefits, which only exacerbates the homelessness. So, so yeah, there's a lot of interagency coordination that could and should be happening. You want to take another question? Um, my name is Nina DiMartini. I'm a builder of affordable housing, and I'd like to speak to something that got mentioned by almost everyone. Um, this program underway uh, by many city agencies to look at the codes and the zoning, and the good news, Patrick, is that much of it does not require new legislation. It's, for example, HPD has its own internal design guidelines. They can be altered, um, you know, with a wave of the commissioner's pen, pen or something. Um, and how it helps um, low-income families is that it would increase the number of units built at all levels, market, below market, you know, low-income, whatever name we call them, which um, would benefit so many people freeing up other units. So for example, only 17% of the households in New York City are traditional families of a parent and child. Those units are being used by other people, young people who would be happy to live in a um, 
a setting that's more social, that's a smaller unit with a shared kitchen or some other shared facilities. We're not asking the families to live in those units, but to look at the housing code, which prevents all sorts of socialized settings for young people. We thrive on the influx of young people to the city. We all need them. Um, and, and single people, which are a majority of the people living here in single households. So it's a way of increasing the, the um, number of units, which to use a bad term, trickle down, but um, make so many more household units available to families. And it's something that doesn't have to wait um, a very long time. There's all the city agencies, fire, buildings, so, um, planning, housing, we're all working together. And I think there'll be some changes, some pilot programs, and I just want to shed a little bit of okay. sunshine. Th thank you. And uh, Patrick, interested in your, I mean, as I you raise this question. It's yourself. not a question of whether those kinds of reforms are, are worthwhile. And I think reasonable, those sort of, some of those reasonable reforms will make a difference, but will it really make a difference at the scale we're talking about in terms of that we lost a fifth of all the housing units affordable to low-income families over a seven year period. I don't think it's gonna, I think that kind, those kinds of reforms are important at the margins, but they're not gonna make a difference at that scale. And then in terms of addressing the problem of homelessness, again, uh, we have concrete proposals on the table from the city council and you know, consensus among service providers and folks working on the front lines about how we could address those problems right now to make a difference for thousands of kids and families. And again, I. It's not to dismiss, I know I'm not comparing the two, but I'm, comp we operate housing as well. I understand. I'm just saying that I think there's, what we're talking about is a way right now we could make a difference for thousands of kids okay, to escape okay. homelessness. Okay, so we have a, um, we have a disagreement. <laughs> Can I have another question? is Brandy McNeil and I work for foster care agency and my question is to Catherine I work with some parents who um, their children came into foster care due to DV issues mm -hmm. however what we found is that if they don't have their children then they're not able to receive help through the domestic violence system is there any help available to single <coughs> mothers the domestic violence shelter system is actually open to, to, uh, to adults without children with them. They are technically eligible for the system, but because of the design of the system, so it's interesting to go to this from the zoning questions, is that the, the shelters were originally built with layouts that were more suitable for families. So what happens is when a single individual without children needs a shelter space, there's simply fewer of them. Unlike the Department of Homeless Services, the domestic violence shelter system is finite because there is no right to shelter. We're not governed by the same set of regulations. So there's a static number of beds, very few, I think too few are for single adults without children. And that means that often when those folks are calling the domestic violence hotline looking for space, they're not gonna find it. And it's, it's, it's a problem. It's an access problem um, that, that needs to be addressed, but it's not um, categorically impossible. There, the help is technically available. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Thank you. Is there another question? Good morning. My name's Kendall Jackman. I'm a housing campaign leader with Picture the Homeless. I'm a former postal employee, and I've been living in the shelter system since 2009. $3,887 is spent of my tax money every month. Part of that goes to the shelter nonprofit provider, uh, 3533, and the other 354 goes to my storage for my one-bedroom apartment. The apartment I was living in before my landlady went into foreclosure was uh, $950 rent. So each month you pay my rent four times. Every three months you pay my rent for a year. Uh, Mr. Banks hit on part of the problem. It's the real estate people in this city and the banks. I'm a bed -Stuy girl. I know buildings who've been, that have been warehoused for more than 50 years. bed -Stuy, Harlem, and East New York are the highest people going into the shelter system because you're gentrifying those communities. One of your solutions we came up with, there's legislation in the city council titled annual census of vacant buildings and lots. The city would be required to count them every year and have a space on their website where you would find out how much there is in the city. 
We counted the top 20 community boards this summer and found enough potential vacant space in buildings and lots to house 199,981 people in 20% and a third of the city. We have a solution. There's housing sitting. Nobody's using it. The banks got bailed out. If you take it back from them, we have a place to live. Anybody interested? Okay. If anybody is interested, our report is available online, www.picturethehomelessoneword.org. It's a PDF. You can download it, share it, get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you. Any? I, okay. I mean, yes. Information certainly is the best disinfectant to uh, uh, policies that may not make sense. Yes, sir. Hello, I'm Barry Walner. Again, following up on that issue related to the homes, the foreclosed homes, the banks now are doing loan modifications. There are a lot of one to four family units, especially in Brooklyn, where if your bank is allowing the owner to stay in it by giving him a loan modification, a subsidy to allow the tenants in those units to stay there, letting the bank collect that money might be a way in which you can bring people into those units because there are a lot of units in which people have moved out or cannot stay there because of the fact that the banks are basically were foreclosing. So by through the loan modification programs where they're stretching out your payments uh, for the homeowner, those three units or two units above them might be available. Another good idea. Uh, are there other questions? Ah, okay. My name's Judith Patel. I am disabled and senior. I was on the fixed income program. Um, I have no children under 18, so I'm not eligible for FEPS. I do not have any third party that can sign for me as would be required by our HRA. I've already tried for a one-shot deal. So as a single, I'm just left out in the cold as many of the uh, senior disabled in the fixed income program to the tune of somewhere around 1,500 people and probably higher. I've heard everybody address families and I've had my family. They're deceased now. Uh, so I can't fit in that category. I am not able to work and anybody who wants to challenge that is more than welcome to look at my medical records from many doctors over a four year period. So what exactly can you do for us, for the single people and the seniors that we have paid our dues, we have worked over the years? Yeah, I mean, Emily, <clears throat> then. I was just going to my okay, understanding of the there was a version of the Advantage program, I think under the first iteration of the program, which was uh, called Fixed Income Advantage, which was targeted to uh, individuals uh, who couldn't work, who are on fixed incomes, people with disability benefits. And I thought that those individuals had been promised to get Section 8 vouchers at the, the time the Advantage subsidy expired. So maybe some of the folks from DHS here could Talk to some of the which I was you. promised priority section eight okay. back so maybe in two thousand and nine. Maybe there's some folks you could talk to. I think there's some in the audience still you could talk to after the. Actually, after. I've spoken to HPD. I requested a uh, explanation of what a rent burden was, and basically was quizzed up and down of where did you find that word, <laughs> and how do you know about that. And, and when I tried to get an explanation out of them, they told me that it was only for certain buildings. That was the only answer I could get. Okay. So I have been to the other agencies. I've been to all the eviction prevention programs. I am in facing housing court right now. I've been there twice, going back the third time. And so I'm not sure what this eviction prevention is if I end up in housing court and you can't help me. Th thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, last question. Hi, Kate Sinak from HPD. Um, actually, I just wanted to address your comment. Um, all of the definitions for rent burden and everything else is online at hpd.gov. Um, 
uh, HPD is a little different from NYCHA because our waiting lists are not open to the general public and they are linked to the buildings that are built through HPD with the assistance of HDC and others. Um, so my kind of question is, I, I've worked in Section 8, I'm now in the asset management side, so I've got to see um, how hard everyone works to try to get these families housed, both on the client side and now also on the landlord side. Um, as I work with regulatory agreements, I see a lot of issues with enforcing them. While the regulatory agreements do have homeless free rental requirements, um, it is hard to enforce this. And until everyone is going to be on board, including our sponsors, which are very important in the equation. Um, housing does need to include all of these public-private partnerships. Mike, I have a three-part question. A, how do you see an opportunity, Ms. Youssef, in how to enforce these or beef up our carrots and our sticks in this regard? I've also seen the cost of building units skyrocket. And I also think it, there might be some opportunity to look at line items to reduce these costs. For example, I myself, I, I have been fortunate not to be homeless. However, even when I look for a unit, I, it's not important to me to have granite countertops. I know that we are building units such as these, and this takes away from the funds needed to build more units. So can, is there an opportunity to talk about reductions and also more discussion about the micro unit uh, building that we're looking at? And thirdly, this is open to everybody, obviously. Um, has there been discussion also on homelessness prevention and poverty re uh, prevention rather than just looking at the end effect of homelessness? Thank you. Um, well, first, um, the wait list isn't open to the general public. However, the housing that HPD and HDC builds is open to the general public and people respond. So I, I don't want anybody here to think that it's built for certain people. You know, it, wherever it is built, there's advertisements and the letters come in. And then there is a site-specific wait list that is developed. So just, you know, to clarify that, it that's how it works, right? So the, um, and the granite countertops, what you're talking about is if there is a building that is an 80-20, that's 80% market, 20% um, affordable. Or if there's a building that is any kind of mix like that, 50-30-20, 50% market, 30% uh, middle income, 20% affordable. The developers are allowed, in fact, in the market rate units because they charge market rates to put in the amenities and often they will upgrade and put in, you know, granite countertops or marble bathrooms. In the affordable units, they have to be the same size, but they don't have to have those finishes. So when you build finished, um, um, when units are affordable and they're built, they rarely have the most expensive, expensive amenities. So in a mixed income building, you will see some apartments like that, but they are usually the market rate ones. So that's, they're not, the developers aren't, aren't spending money <clears throat> that should go for affordable housing on those. And HPD, spends a great amount of time looking at the specs in particular buildings and making sure everything is correct like that. The micro units, I, you know, which is, we've all been talking about, I think is something that is, you know, is great. And I think, again, that high density is the way to go. The truth is there's just not enough housing that exists in New York City, period, to be able to house, you know, everybody who needs housing. Okay. The delinquencies are, you know, not delinquencies, I'm sorry. When you look at the amount of vacancies, it is considered by HUD and has been for at least the last 10 years, maybe longer, a housing emergency because, and that is defined by HUD, if your vacancy rate is below 5%, and it has always been below 5% here. Okay, uh, I just want to, uh, Catherine, you said. I just want to address your point about the re-rentals and the enforcement. New Destiny had done a pilot program called Project Safe Home, which was designed to 
take survivors of domestic violence from the shelter system and link them to those homeless unit re-rentals um, and tax credit buildings developed um, by HDC and HPD. And it was very successful. What we learned during that pilot is that there, I'm just getting back to the interagency coordination thing again. There's a lot of problems with the process where the sponsors, the landlords, get the names of eligible individuals and families residing in shelters from the Department of Homeless Services. Historically, HRADV <coughs> shelters have been totally cut out of that process. Um, sponsors don't get enough names in a timely manner to fill those vacancies. Um, and, and so I think that if we really look at how that linkage happens, enforcement could be improved because it's not sponsor friendly. So I think that there is some work that we can do to make that smoother so people aren't languishing in shelters while there's affordable, empty apartments just sitting there. It makes no sense. So I just wanted to point that out, that there has been some work, and I encourage you to check out um, New Destiny's website, newdestinyhousing.org. Um, and we have a report on our Project Safe Home pilot that talks about some of those successes, which I think is worth looking at. And frankly, the agencies working together is something that NYCHA is doing both with HPD and HDC when we have to market something. But it is really the agency's responsibility, both HPD and HDC, they oversee the marketing. And then when you hear them say, which they have on occasion, you know, oh, we couldn't get enough um, <clears throat> people from DHS. Obviously, something's gone awry in the marketing because you can't say that we have so many homeless people, yet we can't supply the names. So it has to be an internal problem. All right. Um, unfortunately. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have to end it there. Um, before we go, I want to thank Ilana Moyer, who's a student who did a tremendous amount of the work putting this together, and Jackie Wayans for the logistics. And thanks to the panel and to Michael for doing all this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.